Uh, our next panel is, I'm really happy to have here, in part because they're all former colleagues, uh, but they're also real, uh, very deep veterans of the Microsoft litigation itself. Uh, sadly, they are all from the government side. We had hoped to have someone from the Microsoft side here. We had Michael Lacabara, who was a real star at Sullivan and Cromwell in the defense of Microsoft, uh, who had to pull out at the last minute because of a family crisis, and we were hoping uh, that we could get somebody else from Microsoft in, but the time was just too short. So we appreciate you trying. Uh, it would have been nice uh, for a little more balance, but this will still be a terrific panel. I'm going to introduce the moderator, then let him introduce everybody else uh, as they go forward. Uh, John Cove, sitting right here, is a longtime colleague of mine in the Antitrust Division of the Justice Department. He's uh, there every step of the way in the Microsoft trial. Uh, and then left afterward and went to uh, Boyes, Schiller, and Flexner, where he's now a partner and works on a wide variety of antitrust matters, both civil and criminal. John. Thank you, Phil. Uh, let me start out by introducing uh, the panel here. Uh, to my left is Tam Ormiston, who is the Chief Policy Deputy Attorney General uh, for the Attorney General's Office in the state of Iowa. Uh, he is also the Deputy Director of the National State AG Program at Columbia Law School. Uh, he was involved on behalf of the states uh, from the inception of the case uh, until the final remedial phases. Uh, next to him is Karma Giulianelli, uh, who was a key member of the DOJ's uh, trial team from the San Francisco field office and who is now a partner in the Bartlett Beck firm in Denver. And to her left is Steve Houck, uh, who is now of counsel at uh, Menneker and Herman. Am I pronouncing that correctly, Steve? Menarchy. Menarchy and, and Herman. Uh, he, uh, he led the state's trial efforts, again, from the inception uh, through the remedy phase as the uh, chief of the antitrust uh, section of the New York AG's office. Uh, we're going to start out with, uh, with Karma, who, and, and the, the uh, subject of the presentation today is uh, integrating substantive law uh, strategy and trial tactics in a complex monopolization case. Uh, so uh, the basic plan here will be to address some of the issues that came up in trial, how they were handled, uh, how they may be handled uh, today. Uh, and we want this program to be as interactive as possible. I thought the last one was, was great and in, in we had audience participation. So if, uh, if you have a, have a chance, if you have questions that are, that are timely uh, while the presentation is going on, please feel free to raise your hands. We're going to try to leave at least uh, 20 minutes uh, at the end uh, to, uh, for, for a separate question and answer session so you can reserve your questions till then. Uh, we, since the Microsoft folks unfortunately were unable to be here, uh, we're not probably going to have as much give and take as we had anticipated with the panel. So feel free for uh, anyone who wants to chime in with opposite views, uh, we, we would welcome that. So I, I'm going to start with Karma, who's going to start off talking about uh, the use of intent evidence in a monopolization case. I can't help myself but start with a few other things first. Uh, <laughs> prompted by some of the, the comments earlier. They're a hard act to follow. And they were a walk through memory lane because, of course, I remember walking into Bill Malone's office in 1996, and he said, we need to get on the phone with David Heiner and Bill Newcomb and tell them we're sending a civil investigative demand in connection with the famous parenthetical, which was in the consent decree that we saw. So it's been a long process since then. And Dean Kagan uh, opened her remarks by welcoming, I think, the way she characterized it, the winners in the case and the losers. Well, I'm not sure, in retrospect, more than a decade later, who the winners and the losers are. It's not clear to me that there are winners or that there are losers. The question of whether the computer industry would look any different if the case had not been brought um, is, is an interesting question. I happen to think that uh, the computer industry probably, uh, the way it panned out, would, would not look any different had the case not been brought. 
Um, there were certainly interesting legal battles along the way. I think that Microsoft uh, made good business decisions, uh, if not legal decisions, because it's been very profitable and remains so, although it's ended up paying a lot of money in fines. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the legal battles because they do inform the trial, the trial tactics and strategy that one uses in complex antitrust cases. Uh, although there have been interesting legal battles, I'm not sure that the law is any more clear either on the standards for what violates the antitrust laws when we're talking about Section 2. Now, we certainly know from the DOJ's uh, lack of Section 2 cases and pronouncements this month on the way it views Section 2 that uh, the, the way the DOJ views the cases, but the jurisprudence is not any more clear. Um, in, in terms of in terms of section two, so the key thing I think when you are facing any complex case or an antitrust complex antitrust case is to capital and how you capitalize and defend on the evidence that's necessary actually necessary to proving your case is first coming up with a consistent theme and. You have to pick your battles early. You have to prepare a cohesive defense or offense based on a few simple themes. The more complex the case is, the more important this is. And this requires making difficult decisions about what not to defend since we're here, or, or what to defend. Since we're here talking about Microsoft, one example that I know a lot of commentators have discussed, and I'd actually love to hear from some representatives of Microsoft, was the decision to really fight uh, the battle about whether they had a monopoly power in the case. Now, I know that it's uh, a, a very difficult decision because a company the size of Microsoft having a conceding monopoly power or having a ruling that says they have monopoly power makes life much more difficult in many respects. But, but it was a, a tactical decision that in some ways uh, diverted a lot of attention during the trial from, from other matters and could be said to have damaged their economist. I remember, I, I believe that their lead economist actually issued a report concluding that Microsoft, uh, that if Microsoft were really a, a monopoly, the, the price of the operating system would be approximately $1,800. And this was when PCs were selling uh, for about $1,000. Uh, and that, that's, that was a, a big question during the case that took a lot of time. Uh, and there are reasons for deciding whether to, to defend one area or not, but one big lesson that uh, we all learned and, and should remember is to, to decide which battles you need to fight and to pick those battles and being selective in the things. Carmen, let me let me interrupt you since there, since there's no Microsoft uh, representative. Sure. Let me let me play devil's advocate for a second. I believe it was Microsoft's position that while they had a large share of uh, PC operating systems, it was. Uh, they were threatened by all sorts of different paradigms, including uh, handhelds, uh, distributed computing, uh, all those things that um, certainly have become more popular today, although I don't, I don't think they've <coughs> shaken the monopoly power of Microsoft. Uh, w w the Dr. Schmalzi's conclusion that it was an 18, that the, the true value of a, of a monopoly operating system would have been $1,800, I don't think past any kind of plausibility test, but uh, the paradigm shift. Well, like we're doubles out well <laughs> I, I, I got two or three sentences, and I, 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 I couldn't go further. <laughs> but, 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 but what's your response to, to, to that argument? Well, I think that that's an argument that's still being made today, or perhaps we'll see uh, being made today in, in many of the contexts that have been discussed uh, earlier involving current DOJ investigations, for example, uh, I think that it depends on 
whether the company is taking actions that could defeat technology that could represent a paradigm shift. So sure, markets evolve quickly, threats pop up, but if you have the power to squelch the threats, they might not pop up. Okay. And, and if we see that the eye toaster, which I, I think made a splash for a bit during the trial, has never materialized. Not that the eye toaster was going to be uh, the, the big threat, but there were a bunch of cited threats at the time. Yes. Well, how does intent play in all this? Well, so, so let me get to that because... Could I just come in on that? Sure. Um, I think there's another point about the handhelds and the other things. And Karma was the lawyer who prepared me for my testimony, so I remember everything she told me, but she doesn't seem to remember everything I, everything I said. Uh, <laughs> I absolutely do. All right, well, the issue was not whether uh, Microsoft had monopoly power over the PCs. It was whether monopoly power had monopoly power over the operating systems and PCs. And put aside Professor Schmalensee, um, the charge for the operating system was a very small part of uh, the price of the PC. And the notion that Microsoft had no power over that price, that if it raised the price 10% or 20% or whatever, it was going to cause a great flood of people to abandon PCs and go to handhelds, uh, was just wrong. Well, Frank, how, how would you address the argument that um Dr. Schmalenzi's argument that there was a, there was a, a race, a race to, to a monopoly, and he didn't characterize it that way, but, but each, uh, each firm wants to, to be the leader and capture those network effects, and if you do, there's a big reward for doing so, and having, having, uh, having that potential reward in front of you is what encourages investment and innovation in these areas, and indeed, sometime around the time that the D.C. Circuit, uh, <clears throat> or around the time that the uh, judge's decision came down, the stock market, the internet bubble burst, and people stopped investing in the, uh, the well, second uh, inter internet pet store online. I, I always felt that if the Microsoft case had something to do with bursting the internet bubble, I was just one of the pricks. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> I'm permitted to say that. <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, I think there's something in Schmalensee's argument, but that's not what the case was about. The case wasn't about uh, whether Microsoft had monopoly power. I mean, as a, as a preface, it is uh, the winner of that contest obtained monopoly power, and that was a natural, so to speak, phenomenon, uh, the result of the network effects. And had Microsoft had done nothing more, uh, there, I don't think there would have or should have been an antitrust case. But Microsoft did quite a lot to protect uh, the, uh, the, network, uh, the network effects, or what was called in the case the application's barrier to entry, that uh, prevented others from competing for, uh, uh, competing in the, oper in the operating systems market. Okay. Well, Karma, are you, you going to go on with, 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 sure. with, with what some of those actions were? Professor Fisher, you've given me a great segue into the intent question. I try. Because, because one of the core questions in the cases is whether the conduct is actually anti-competitive. And that's the hardest question. Um, it's very murky, ambiguous, and there are no clear standards. These are very fact-specific cases. As we all know, although possessing monopoly power is not in and of itself unlawful, using it in an improper means is. But what is an improper means? The Supreme Court has established specific tests for conduct in the predatory pricing area, but it's never really articulated similarly explicit standards in the context of what is potentially exclusionary conduct. There was this Aspen skiing case where uh, the court discussed whether conduct had a valid business reason, but that, of course, is not so clear, and I competitive, or competitive and exclusionary conduct often looks alike. And the same conduct can often have beneficial and exclusionary results, 
and the same conduct can be motivated by both exclusionary uh, results and sometimes uh, uh, and exclusionary purposes and sometimes uh, competitive purposes. So this makes it very hard to distinguish conduct that's lawful from conduct that's not. Um, and that's led to many different articulations of what exclusionary conduct is by courts and commentators alike. Since we're here to talk about the Microsoft case, of course the DC Circuit talked about this balancing act where you look first at whether there's an anti-competitive effect and then you look at whether uh, there is a non-pretextual pro-competitive justification for it and then you do some sort of balancing to see which outweighs which. The standard in many ways makes sense. I think others will talk about the legal theory. Then you have other standards. You have this, uh, pro, this profit sacrificing standard, which looks a lot like the standards in the context of predatory pricing. You have standards that go to whether you're hurting equally efficient competitors. But all of these standards, and this is really where I'm going, involve ultimately looking at intent. Uh, although specific intent is not an actual element of an, uh, a Section 2 monopolization case that plays a role when you're talking about attempted monopolization, it very much informs, I think, the analysis. And the conduct will turn, of course, on economic testimony and looking at whether firms have valid business reasons for their conduct, but it's most important to look at what the firms themselves think and say, because that can inform uh, the analysis of whether they in fact did have a non-pretextual reason for their conduct. It's not determinative necessarily, and that in and of itself is not clear cut. We saw a lot of emails uh, during the Microsoft trial and a couple of emails, I think, from Joachim Kempen and, uh, and others and, and Bill Gates a few minutes ago that could be equally consistent with very uh, strong competitive conduct of the kind that we would promote and, and want in this economy uh, and in, in this country for capitalism. So even evidence of intent is, is murky, and that is where trial strategy especially comes into play. Because when you have emails like, let's kill the competition, it's very important not to run from those emails and to, in the beginning of the case, know exactly what is out there and have a clear and consistent story about them and face them head on. And I think that's one lesson that was learned from the Microsoft case uh, by, by practitioners and in preparing for depositions, really having the witnesses prepared to take the emails um, and explain them in context in a non-defensive way. Karen? when the emails came up over and over again, um, I, I talked with a couple of people who represented IBM during its long fight with the government. And what they thought was that Microsoft ought to have embraced the emails, that's the language, embraced the yeah. emails. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think that, I think that uh, you know, I do mostly defense now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this was not the same karma. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm pretty moderate here, um, and and I think that it's it's critically important to, uh, at the very beginning of the case, gather the evidence, see what is there, come up with the key themes, not get caught in the weeds, although you need to know the weeds, but really choose what your two or three core defenses are going to be, and they have to be they have to be consistent with the evidence in the emails and you use them to your advantage in the best way possible. So I think using the emails and highlighting them yourself and maybe even using your own bad documents and opening statements and explaining them. I don't actually remember uh, Microsoft's opening statement. They may even very well 
Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think it, it, they, it, during the trial, different witnesses had different approaches. Uh, I, Bill Gates in his deposition never quite decided whether he was going to say Netscape is a threat or not, or, what the, or, or whether he really understood what the meaning of competitor was or not. Um, it was some of the witnesses did a better job of others. Some of them did a good job of embracing their own emails, that is, emails that they authored, but had a very difficult time dealing with emails that Bill Gates had offered because they could explain what they said. Yes, well, I was a little bit over the top there, a little locker room language. Well, we were in a competitive battle, and, and that's why I said let's, uh, to use a euphemism, do bad things to Java, for example. Uh, but when they were caught with a Bill Gates email, they felt the need to defend him in ways that were not credible and interpret those emails that were contrary to most people's understanding. And it was really something that hurt several witnesses very badly at trial. They were, they were well prepared and, and smooth on their own uh, writings, but, but weren't on others. Uh, there's always going to be a defense in a monopolization case that this is just locker room talk. This is, ju this is just, you know, firing the troops up to go out there and compete. And, and of course, that's what the antitrust laws want to encourage. Uh, so you, you, you can't look at in, in, intent alone is never going to make a, make a monopolization case, obviously. You have to look at the conduct, and the conduct has to be anti-competitive, and it has to have an anti-competitive effect. But those emails are clearly, uh, and those admissions are clearly uh, relevant. And I think it's also important to remember that not all of these kind of uh, statements of intent were only statements of intent. Some of those statements of intent were made to third parties with the goal and purpose of cutting the legs out from competitors. Uh, the evidence showed that Bill Gates in 1995 went down to Intel. And uh, we talked earlier about, about somebody having a Google perhaps now having a, a balancing effect or similar amounts of power to, to offset Microsoft. Uh, back in 1995, Intel was certainly the firm that came the closest to having any kind of market power that could uh, offset uh, Netscape, I mean, excuse me, that could offset Microsoft. Uh, he went down there and he said uh, two things. One, we don't want Intel writing platform level software. We own software down to the silicon. Two, we don't want you supporting Netscape as a platform. Uh, it's okay to support them as an application, as a, as, as a, as a value-added application, but don't support their platform function, their APIs, and, and, and because the, the platform function is the function that if, if Netscape were successful in getting a platform off the ground, would weaken, they didn't, they didn't go this far in what they said to Intel, but obviously the reasoning is that to get the platform off the ground, uh, that's what's going to weaken Microsoft's power in the operating system monopoly. And later, a Microsoft executive said to Intel personnel, uh, we're going to cut off Netscape's air supply. And at trial, well, that's just locker room talk. It wasn't just locker room talk. It was Intel, do not support Netscape because we're going to cut off the air, the air supply. Any money you invest in supporting them as a platform is going down the tubes. This is our plan. We're going to do it, get out of the way. So it's not just intent, it's conduct with intent. Uh, and, and John, you know, thinking back at, at the time that we did this trial, email in many respects was in its infancy, and Microsoft was using uh, email very, very effectively. I mean, those emails at 2, 3, 4 o'clock on a Sunday morning, uh, it, that, that was remarkable to see the breadth and bulk of material. And in a way, it was kind of the first, first experience for a lot of people to think about how to deal with those emails, the bulk, what was said in them, the way that it was said. And, and now I think we've, we've learned something from that and, and in, in, in later trials on the way we manage that. But that was kind of the first cut at how you start thinking about the kind of exposure that the emails created. That's right. Oh, but it's human nature. <laughs> It is, it is human nature. The, the emails are still, still out there. I can 
That's how you. There, <laughs> it, it, how you I, might deal with them. Is yeah. How question. you might deal with them is another question, but I don't think you can get people to not write things. Like, in every case, you're going to find something good, and, or you're going to have to defend something that, that, that might be taken out of context or not be so good. I just want to make a couple points about <coughs> uh, email, about, uh, also about Bill Gates. Uh, the point on the email is, you know, David Boyce is uh, one of the best cross-examiners in the country for sure. Uh, but people who don't get enough credit are Karma and John and Phil uh, and some of the folks from my state trial team who organized all the email that David was so, uh, so effectively used in cross-examining witnesses. Uh, and then there was, uh, you mentioned Bill Gates uh, and some of his email. I actually thought, um, you know, maybe the most critical uh, part of the trial was, it was Bill Gates' testimony, which, uh, which David and I took in discovery. and was played throughout the trial. And Mr. Gates uh, there was you know, extraordinarily combative. Uh, and I think, um, you know, that set the tone not only uh, for his deposition, which was played throughout the trial, but for the other Microsoft witnesses as well. I think that was uh, some of the problem they had in dealing with the uh, email with, you know, with, uh, you know Carmen and John and Phil were going to so effectively. Actually, yeah. I have something, one thing to add about the, the Gates deposition. I think that it was used in a very clever and perhaps unfair way. I'm surprised that we got away with it uh, because if you take the whole deposition in context, it, it um, he, he was not, certainly he was combative in in areas, but it was a couple of days, I think two or three day deposition. And what happened was at the beginning of each particular topic in the trial, say we were going to talk about Apple, we were able to say, okay, where's Bill Gates, the best clips on Apple, and play those clips. And the judge let us play the best clips on Apple. And normally in trials, you have depositions where you do designations and it all comes out in order and it's in one day and the plaintiff designates some and the defendant does and it's played in sequence. So I think that the government there uh, did get did get lucky in the way it was able to use the Bill Gates deposition in all fairness. Farmers clearly know the defense are way too long. And I think that deposition preparation uh, it plays a long that actually, I think the way this happened was we did attempt to uh, play them uh, right. in their entirety. And, we did. And yes, absolutely. Microsoft kept uh, you know, dragging the proceedings out right. um, you know, each day, each day, each day. I think it was, I think it was David's brilliant idea to do it the way we did it. And of course, the judge did uh, give us a question. And it allowed a great focus, you know, of, of Bill Gates with the little five minute clip at the beginning of each day. And it never took the focus off of it. So uh, that doesn't happen in many trials. Yeah, I think if there's one way that the tr that this trial has changed litigation, it's in the preparation of witnesses. Uh, my, this is conceitedly anecdotal, but uh, in my experience before that trial, certainly depositions were being videotaped before that time. Uh, but uh, it was not uncommon for senior executives to decide to not be knowledgeable or to, to if, if, if they just wanted to stay out of a case, to not remember things, to not remember documents. Uh, stonewalling, I think, was, was much more common. And I think how effectively those depositions were used, coupled perhaps with Mr. Clinton's testimony about what, what depending on what the meaning of is is being played over and over again on TV, has sort of brought home to lawyers who in the past were tempted to stonewall that if these kind of tapes are played in court, your client is not going to look good and it's going to redound to your detriment. And um, again, my, my, my point of view is anecdotal, but my, my sense certainly is you run into a lot less stonewalling. You, witnesses may not always answer your question, but at least they'll... The, <coughs> They'll say something in, in, in response and, 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 and be more prepared to articulate their themes. And uh, to me, to me, I, th I think it's a noticeable change. Others may have, I don't know if you, if you all have any thoughts on that from your experience. I think, I, I think that that's absolutely right. But I also, and I think that a lot of um, how a deposition turns out depends on how the personalities at the deposition interact and how the deposing lawyer uh, acts and whether the deposing lawyer is 
investigating under the witness's skin or not. And again, having been at the Bill Gates deposition, David is a brilliant lawyer and did a wonderful job there. Uh, and he really did not stop pressing Mr. Gates on many of the same questions over and over and over. And when you do that for two or three days, you can get some pretty good you know, testimony and, and, and splices. And then when the judge lets you play it in bits and pieces like that, it's helpful. So and, you know, uh, when, you, when you're talking about, uh, I think that, I think that it, that deposition, he did a masterful job. But when you're talking about deposition preparation and how it's changed, one key thing to remember as a trial strategy is just that uh, you have to tell your witnesses you could be there for two or three days and exhausted and your demeanor must never change. And uh, you can you should answer the question in the same way because you don't know what part will get played. I, I disagree with Farmer because I do think actually the uh, excerpts that uh, play gave a fair representation of what happened. Uh, Bill Gates' defense, I should say, I, I took the first day of the deposition of the liability trial. I attended his deposition in the remedies trial. He was much, much better. He did a terrific job, so he, he learned uh, you know, learned his lesson and he improved, and obviously there was some more in involved as well. Uh, he did uh, you know, a very fine job uh, some time around. I'm actually not implying that it wasn't a fair representation, but I think that it's, um, I think when you have multiple days of questioning, it's, it's easy, and you try to condense that into an hour or more, it's easy. All right. Well, why don't why don't we move along uh, to to Steve's presentation? Uh, Phil mentioned today uh, earlier the DOJ uh, report on Section Two conduct, which was issued this week, and uh, the FTC's commissioner's uh, really unprecedented reaction to it. Uh, I think they accurately characterized it as radical. And we may, I'm sure that the speakers tomorrow will talk about some of the particulars of that. But one thing that brought home uh, was that in addition to having competition in, uh, among firms in the economy, it's sometimes good to have competition among enforcement authorities. Uh, there's, you know, three major uh, centers of enforcement, antitrust enforcement authority in the United States, the DOJ Antitrust Division, the FTC, and the state uh, attorney general's offices. And uh, Steve as I, and Tam, as I said before, were there from uh, the beginning and uh, to the end, a lot longer than Karma and I were there. And uh, I want to turn it over to Steve now to talk about, about the, the... Well, well said, John. Competition is a good thing among yes. enforcement agencies. Uh, I originally was going to talk about the case uh, from the state's perspective, but since Microsoft isn't here, I thought I'd talk about it from Microsoft's perspective instead. <laughs> That's okay with you, Brad. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. I'll go back to my original plan. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I, what I wanted to do was to give uh, a brief overview of uh, you know, the state's involvement uh, in, in the case, particularly the trial. Uh, and I, there's an article uh, in your materials that I wrote with Kevin O'Connor just to correct the, or not correct, but to uh, supplement the record of uh, the Judge Kagan gave, the Dean Kagan gave of the uh, various Harvard Law School alumni involved in the trial, Kevin O'Connor, who succeeded me as lead counsel for the states, and he was the chief of the antitrust of Wisconsin, is also a Harvard Law School graduate. So you can get a fuller uh, view there. So what I wanted to do is uh, briefly cover uh, the trial, talk a little bit about uh, remedies, perhaps, uh, and also uh, talk a little bit about uh, how what the Court of Appeals did uh, impacted the trial. Tam is going to talk, I think, more from a higher level about some of the public policy issues uh, uh, involved in the state's participation in the case uh, and explain why the state's got involved. But from my perspective, uh, as chief of the antitrust group in New York State, uh, the reason the state's got involved was pretty simple. And with all due respect to Gary, Gary Greenback's white papers and my Harvard Law School education, I was looking at the emails that uh, Professor Zittrin put up on the uh, board here, and it seemed pretty clear to me uh, that there might be a problem uh, in Microsoft's conduct. And furthermore, uh, from the state's perspective, uh, what's very important uh, to them is uh, the impact of anti-competitive or potentially anti-competitive conduct on consumers. And it seemed to us that there uh, might be a very significant impact on consumers, particularly because this case focused on the on-ramp to the internet. 
Uh, and also, uh, it seemed to us that there was a potentially significant uh, impact on innovation, and um, there was a fear that what Microsoft was doing was uh, skewing innovation. So the states were very interested. Um, it was by no means clear to the states uh, that if we did do something, uh, the DOJ would. Uh, Phil mentioned that earlier the case the DOJ had brought that was settled, uh, and it seemed to us that uh, you know, the settlement agreement didn't really uh, result in much change. I'm not sure anybody really would argue with that. And moreover, in New York, uh, we had just uh, taken a look at the Bell Map 9X merger and had urged the DOJ to get involved in that, and um, they declined to do that. So, uh, you know, we felt that if we weren't uh, prepared to do something, uh, something might not be done. Uh, and finally, uh, we, uh, we wanted to be on the scene to have, uh, have an impact on uh, the remedies decision, uh, which is recently events have shown, uh, turned out to be a very wise decision indeed. Uh, there's various levels of coordination. I would say prior to the uh, filing of the complaints, I would describe the, uh, the investigation we did at DOJ did as running on parallel tracks. There was actually very little uh, interchange of views, I would say, among the states and the DOJ. Uh, we eventually, uh, states that is, decided to file a lawsuit we actually uh, made that decision before DOJ did. Uh, and so we were ready, willing, and able to go to trial, uh, whether DOJ joined us or not. Uh, we told DOJ that we were going to sue, and we hoped uh, certainly that they uh, came to a like decision, which of course they did. Uh, and we were uh, very, very happy to have, uh, have them with us indeed. Uh, once the complaints were filed, uh, Judge Jackson consolidated them, and uh, you know, he was very mindful of uh, uh, they have a problem of uh, moving a complex antitrust case like this uh, quickly enough so that any relief uh, entered would be effective. Uh, he set a very uh, tight uh, trial schedule, uh, and um, I think our you know, the coordination was really very, uh, very extensive uh, throughout the trial. Appearances sometimes can be deceptive. One might look at the states and say, well, there's 20 of them in the District of Columbia. So much, uh, it's probably much more difficult for them to coordinate amongst themselves, even the DOJ and, uh, and Microsoft. And I actually, I felt that wasn't true. Uh, because of the work that Tam and General Tom Miller did behind the scenes, I really had a lot of discretion. And I always looked at DOJ sort of like as a, uh, a tripartite, uh, I say monster, but not monster creature. Uh, there was, uh, uh, you know, clearly it was Joel Klein and, uh, and Doug Melman in D.C. who had the ultimate today, but these guys here, uh, John and Carmen and Phil, uh, really knew much more about the case. That was the DOJ trial team out in San Francisco, and they had uh, their own views about the case, uh, which clearly influenced DOJ. And then, of course, uh, once David uh, Boyce got uh, brought on board, he uh, was a very powerful figure in his own right. Uh, so there were really, you know, sort of uh, three competing uh, centers there. And uh, on the Microsoft side, uh, you know, there was Sullivan Cromwell, and there, there was a, a very strong team of in-house lawyers. And I know that uh, oftentimes we had these pre-trial uh, uh, telephone conferences uh, among the, uh, the three parties to talk about what we were going to do. I was always able to commit for the states. Phil had to go talk to David and Joel first. Uh, David and Joel first, and John Warden for uh, Sullivan Cromwell to go back and check with Dave Miner and some of his colleagues at Microsoft. So, well, the states had a uh, pretty unified uh, effort, and uh, I always felt uh, you know, that I, uh, my views were very uh, carefully listened to and respected by Phil and David, who were clearly the junior partner at the trial. And maybe Phil and David were just good actors. Phil, were you acting when you, you know, indicated interest in what I had to say or not? So, you know. Uh, but anyhow, the, at least at the time, I, you know, I, I, uh, I didn't have any concern with my views that I weren't being uh, listened to. Uh, and uh, you know, I know that DOJ uh, did uh, give us some deference, certainly. Uh, one of the unique features of the trial was that uh, there were just 12 uh, witnesses allowed to sign, and their uh, direct testimony went in in written form. Uh, and of the 12 witnesses, uh, you know, one of the very important uh, slots uh, was ceded to us. There were, one of the unusual features of the trial was there were actually two economists testifying, uh, Professor Fisher, uh, but DOJ gave up uh, one of their squats uh, so that our uh, uh, economist, uh, Rick Ward Bolton, could testify. So I do know that uh, you know they uh, they were appreciative of 
our support, I think both materially and symbolically, uh, because we represented a large cross-section of states, large, small. Uh, my AG was a very conservative Republican. There were other very conservative Republican AGs and there were liberal Democrats. Uh, so I think uh, DOJ, uh, public relations-wise, uh, felt that uh, felt that was useful. Uh, there has been some uh, mention of, uh, of the press, and uh, perhaps one of the uh, most unique phenomena of the case was really the, uh, the press coverage. And uh, just to give an anecdote, my first intersection with the press came uh, one spring afternoon in uh, 1998 when I was sitting in my office uh, in New York, picked up the phone, and it's Joel Klein, and his uh, distinctive, if not malevolent, uh, Bronx twang. And he says, Steve, I have uh, you know, something very confidential to tell you. Uh, you can't tell anyone. You promise not to tell anyone. I said, sure. He said, well, I think I sh should tell you, because you're the lead counsel for the states, I've just hired David Boyce to lead the trial team for the OJ. I said, great. I didn't say anything to anybody. I wake up the next morning, the banner headlines from the <laughs> Wall Street Journal and the New York Times indicating David uh, has been hired by, uh, by the OJ. You weren't the lead? <laughs> 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 yes. um, so, you know, it was always uh, pretty clear to me, uh, there wasn't a lot of coordination on remedy. It was always pretty clear to me uh, that while we might not agree uh, on remedy, it really behooved us to uh, cooperate with DOJ. Uh, you know, we both wanted to win the trial. Uh, and probably uh, the most difficult decision, tactical decision the states had to make was exceeding to David Woods' wish to do all the cross-examination himself which clearly lowered our uh, profile, and this was something that was intensely debated and discussed among our staff attorneys, and even uh, by attorneys general. And um, in the interest of uh, uh, the interest of the case overall, and certainly mindful of David's terrific skills as a cross-examiner, we acceded to his wish to do all the cross-examination. Uh, our career trial staff did the same thing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just to just emphasize again, uh, Phil, did you want to say something? Yeah, go ahead. I'll jump in when you're done. Uh, you know, we're in this academic setting, and I think the tendency often is in academic settings to focus on sort of interesting legal and intellectual issues. But, you know, really the key thing in trial is um, uh, witness credibility. Uh, and, um, you know, I thought that was, uh, yeah, a huge impact on Judge Jackson's uh, the ultimate outcome of the case, his evaluation of what the witnesses said, which, as I said before, uh, it was a result of a lot of work that Phil and, and John and Carmen and other folks uh, did. I want to say a little bit about remedies. Uh, there's one tired academic canard uh, that I read most recently in a paper written by Harry First. I usually agree with almost everything Harry says, and I did in this paper as well. But the point academics make sometimes is that um, the government prosecutors don't uh, pay enough attention to remedy early on in the case. And I think that's absolutely untrue in this case. Uh, at least from the state's perspective. I know, uh, you know the states had a team of lawyers uh, almost from the beginning that uh, you know, heavily researched and thought about the remedies issues. And clearly, the you know, remedies uh, was a problem in the case, but it wasn't because uh, we didn't think about it soon enough. It's just because it's a critical <laughs> problem. I should say that I left around the time the D.C. Circuit case came down, opinion came down, so I wasn't involved in the, in the, nor was Karma involved in the final remedies. But I certainly was involved in the outset, and um, the, the idea that we were not thinking about remedies is absolutely incorrect. The idea that we did not reach a firm conclusion on remedies was correct. It is obviously a tremendously difficult problem, one that you know, may or may not have been solved adequately to everyone's uh, satisfaction. Uh, but. Uh, uh, the idea that we had not uh, de determined a remedy beforehand uh, and had not thought about it is, is, I mean, we felt the best thing to do was go forward with the case, establish liability. In part, it depended on how the case turned out to get to, to determine what the appropriate uh, remedy was. Um, one issue in, in determining a remedy is this was a very difficult case for to convince witnesses to come forward and testify. Uh, Microsoft had and still has 
an enormous amount of power over software developers, OEMs, basically the entire ecosystem in the uh, PC community. Um, to come out publicly and, and for us to go forward, uh, for them to step up and take that risk of testifying and putting, putting themselves out publicly, uh, they had to be convinced that the department was going to seek a serious, meaningful remedy. And I think they were convinced that no promises were made, uh, but they, they understood that there was going to be, that the department was going to look hard and, uh, and, and, and attempt to accomplish a very serious remedy. Now, you know, what ultimately happened, I wasn't there. Maybe, maybe Phil wants to talk, talk a little bit more about it. But uh, this, this uh, DOJ report that was issued this week uh, seems to take up the same theme and, and in some ways suggest that if you, ha if you haven't figured out uh, your remedy in advance, you might as well not bring the case. And I, I disagree most strongly with that. I'm sure when they brought uh, US v. AT&T, they did not have a clear idea of how the uh, consent decree would be structured. Nevertheless, it was a case worth bringing. This case was worth bringing. I, I tend to disagree with Karma that, that things would be exactly the same. Uh, had we, had we lost the case or not brought the case, I think things, there's a question as to whether the, the remedies have had a affirmative remedial effect to, to, to offset the illegal conduct that occurred, but had we not brought the case or had we lost the case, my view is very strong that things would, would be worse. Well, that's what I was referencing, actually, was, was, was the remedy when I made that, oh, yeah. when I made that comment. And I agree with John, absolutely, we were discussing remedies from the beginning and heavily debating them because that is not an easy question. I wasn't there. I left after the liability trial, as John did. But I want to hear from Phil. It strikes me, and ironically enough, my partner Phil back then was brought into the outside counsel uh, for the remedies portion uh, when I was at Fort Beck. And, um, I want to hear from Phil, but my impression is that there simply wasn't enough time on the hearing side and the way that the whole procedure worked out to have a thorough vetting in court of the potential remedies. Is that, was that, how, how, how much did that play? Well, let, let me dodge the question for now by, by saying I'm not going to dodge it, and, and we should certainly ask Phil back as well. But I, I did want to go, before we lose track of it too much, I wanted to jump back to the beginning of your uh, talk, Steve, to something that's important. And that's the idea, as John mentioned, sort of competition between enforcement agencies. And sometimes one, whether it's the states or DOJ or maybe the Europeans, will have a different view and come out more aggressively than another. Uh, and, and there are ways to see that as good, but if you're sitting in, in Brad Smith's chair or another big company's chair, maybe Google's, that's got to be a pretty terrifying prospect that you not only have to sort of deal with one enforcer and have one process and get to one decision, but that the whole thing may uh, sort of get thrown off and you may end up having to do something fairly different with a different enforcer with the states or with uh, yeah, Europeans. Settlements. Uh, actually, it was easier for Microsoft in this context since all the parties were in one uh, in one case. Um, let me just make another point about uh, remedies. Uh, you know, my group of clients in California group uh, certainly uh, believe that the remedies should have been more stringent. Uh, but you know, you raised the question that we just discussed: um, have the remedies had uh, had an effect on Microsoft? Uh, and um, I think one thing that shouldn't be overlooked is just the impact of having uh, enforcement officials looking over Microsoft's shoulder. Uh, and um, I wanted just to read an excerpt from a book that Mary Jo Foley wrote. And she is a you know, very close observer of Microsoft. She does a blog at Microsoft. Uh, and she recently wrote a book on, on, the, on, on the subject of Microsoft. And she said, uh, more than the exponential growth in processor speeds, the rising popularity of open source software, with the skyrocketing market cap of Google, the external event that had the biggest impact on Microsoft in the past 30 years has been the ongoing antitrust scrutiny to which the company has been subject. And I, and I think there is some truth to that. I, you know, the contracts I look at today are much different from the contracts we were looking at back in 1998. And I think certainly Brad Smith and his team of lawyers uh, deserve some, some credit for that, so I want to 
uh, give that credit. Um, I, on um, the subject of why uh, the um, you know, Judge Jackson just entered the remedy, I think, you know, I was going to say a little bit about the court, what the Court of Appeals did. I think a very important part of Judge Jackson's thinking was uh, the law, the time law was so unsettled with what the Court of Appeals had done, I think at Microsoft too, as you said, that he I really wasn't confident that his liability uh, decision was going to stand up, and rightfully so. And I think he just wanted to get uh, an appellate ruling. And I think in the future, uh, one way these cases can be improved is to allow for um, you know, intermediate appeal in the government, complex government antitrust enforcement action, uh, so that the law is clear before you have a very long remedy hearing, like Judge Colicatelli eventually did. Uh, so and let me just conclude. Uh, so I want to give Pam uh, time to talk about running behind time, uh, just to emphasize how important I do think the state's involvement has been over time. As Phil alluded to, uh, most recently. Um, my group of uh, clients, the California group, joined by New York and Louisiana, moved to extend the initial five-year term of the final judgment as it was about to expire. And it was opposed not only by Microsoft, but by DOJ. Uh, so not to put too fine a point on it, uh, DOJ sided with its long-term adversary in probably one of the most important uh, Section 2 cases that it ever prosecuted. And fortunately, from my perspective, uh, the judge uh, agreed with us uh, so today, uh, what we have is the final judgment uh, that is largely enforced by the states alone uh, because DOJ allowed this final judgment to lapse. Uh, so I think that, you know, it's perfectly clear that over time the states have been, um, in my view, the most vigorous and consistent antitrust enforcers. We had a major complaint not too long ago from Google about the way desktop search was treated in Vista. And the states were in the forefront of that and got the uh, Microsoft agreed to make some changes um, as a result of uh, you know, uh, our discussion with Microsoft. Uh, so I think the states have played uh, an important constructive role uh, throughout the case. Thanks. Well, let, let me follow right up on, uh, on what Steve was saying. You know, when Phil began with his, his notion, well, what are the questions we should be asking ourselves? And one of the the original questions, Phil, was, well, what happened if DOJ didn't bring this case? And in a way, that sort of makes a, an important point here. It, it, it eludes a part of this case that, that was fundamental to, I think, its success, and that is the state roles. To take nothing away at all from the federal initiative, I, I think uh, you and I and Tom and Mark Toby and others had the very first meeting uh, in San Francisco thinking about this question and the states were involved from the get-go. Uh, and and, and let, let me tell you why I think this works. I, I sit back and, and I think about the way systems work and how they ought to work uh, to serve the public. And I go back to something very, very fundamental on this question, and that is federalism. The vitality of federalism, the joint uh, uh, responsibility of, of uh, enforcing the antitrust law by the states and the feds together. And I think what that has done has generated what we've, we've already mentioned, the competition uh, even among law enforcement agencies of the marketplace of ideas. The, the, this is serious stuff. Microsoft was a huge American icon. None of this was taken lightly. It was, it was the American success story. And having a lot of very able people, the federal level, state level, and even outside the sphere, thinking about this and helping shape uh, this case and, and, and its significance was fundamental to its success. We wrestled with views, perspectives, theories. Uh, do we, do we, do we, what do we include? What do we not include? Uh, the resources to most efficiently respond to a, a very uh, highly respected company that had loads of resources. And even DOJ alone uh, had, would have difficulty combating that. And it's not only, I think, the question of, of, of resources. It's a question of appearance. Uh, the, the public had faith that this wasn't an, an anti-business administration going after uh, Bill Gates and, and Microsoft which would have been unfortunate indeed. What we had is 20 states representing nearly 60% of the American population, representing conservative Democrats, or conservative Republicans, Democrats, 
we had uh, uh, Judge Robert Pork and Ken Starr. I mean, we represented a broad array of interests that combined to focus upon this very serious issue, tackling uh, the antitrust law in a high-tech environment. And so the states uh, played a role. This isn't a question of, I think, thinking out of the box. This is a question of, of considering very carefully what our joint responsibilities are and how we could work together to address this effectively. And I don't, I, I think we went out of a way not to make it hard on Microsoft to burden them. We combined everything, we did all the depositions, we had the two track the investigations, which ensured, I think, that, that as we move forward separately, when we sat down and we looked at the collected information, that there was, there was some confidence that the issues were real from a legal perspective. So the states are important. Uh, let, me, let me just talk about these institutions. And, and, and I, I think in metaphors, so let me just talk about USDOJ. Enormous talent, internal resources, great power, a huge operation. But it's, it's very much like, if you will, an aircraft carrier or a battleship. It really takes a while for that system to gear up and be able to move effectively and, and concentrate those resources effectively. The states, on the other hand, smaller, sovereign, we can move a little more quickly, we can, we can scramble and, and start addressing things individually and in combination. That also is, is constructive and taken together this complementarity that I think needs to be recognized, that, that those two abilities uh, reinforce one another and taken together uh, with a responsible way to approach this issue. When we go back and we look at this, how did this case really evolve? We had a guy in Texas named, named Mark Toby, and we had other uh, attorneys at the staff level that were looking at this and very troubled by what they were reading and hearing. You know, there was a lot of talk from the state attorney general and the big lobby and looking for the limelight and all of that. But the, the facts of the case, and as one looks at fairly the history, the state AGs and AAGs were really doing this independently. It was staff driven, I think largely at the federal level and largely at the state level. Uh, there are serious resources among the states. Uh, New York brought uh, a, a lot, uh, California and other states. Our small state of Iowa happened to be heavily involved because Tom Miller was, was chairing the antitrust committee for the National Association of Attorneys General. So we had really this incredibly broad range of people with their eyeballs, their ideas, in, in a vigorous debate on where we should be going and how we should proceed. There's a certain uh, sense of reality that comes out of that competition that's been mentioned several times. Would this case have been the same without the states? I don't think it would have. And that's not to diminish the, the, the great effort that was made, but this, this competition, the cooperation, looking at I think it yielded better decisions, more effective strategies. We had complex facts that we wrestled with, comparatively thin resources despite the federal and state uh, capacity. Uh, we were accused of manipulating and, uh, the, uh, the system for political reasons. That went by the wayside because of the cooperation. So I think we played a role. And let me just look at, for the, as quickly as I can, at the individual junctures where states made a contribution, not sitting back, not beating chest, not threatening, just doing what we regard as our job, our responsibility in this legal enforcement system in antitrust that we have in this country. At the investigation level, we did the loan, as Steve said. We, had, we, we, put, we put our case together, and we were aware that because of the complexities that DOJ had faced in the 95 decision, that it was entirely possible that they would be gun shy. That was not a fun experience for them. And even though the staff might be excited about it, I believe that there was a case. You know, there are political realities to bringing these cases, and would the administration, would Joel agree with it? And the fact that we were proceeding ahead and ready to go, we were gonna do it with what we had. We felt that it was that important, we were committed to it. And then when Joel said, we're, we're all in this together, I think, 
uh, it, it served the interest of, of, of all the parties for, for all the right reasons. So we, we combined these. Um, when the cases were filed, they were done but jointly. There was a lot of discussion. We did it in concert. And Judge Jackson very quickly responded by, as you'll recall, all those initial rulings, basically trying to consolidate this and make it something that was fair for the defendant in this case, something that was coherent for a very, very complex case so that it became manageable and that the state-federal uh, joint initiative was, uh, was effective uh, and, and didn't uh, serve unfairly the interests of, of, of Microsoft. The other thing that I think it did is it, it gave some assurance to the business community and the public at large that this was an issue that deserved consideration. This wasn't, this wasn't grandstanding. This wasn't line lighting. This wasn't somebody who came in and lobbied 20 odd states in the federal government. There was an effort to, to persuade, to be sure, by competitors and by, by, uh, by Microsoft itself. But when this decision was made, I think it, it had to give some confidence that this was a serious legal matter that was under consideration. Uh, one of the characteristics that, that, that I really valued throughout this process was the level of trust between Phil and Steve, excuse me, and David and Karma and others who were fighting this fight, uh, putting our experts together, creating a combination that uh, built on the strengths that we had. Uh, as, as Steve has said, we receded in, in our presence in this case. You just don't get much better than David. Uh, he will, he'll be here tomorrow. Uh, we all benefited from that, but we all took our parts we played them out and did them the best way we could to fill the, the, the mission that we felt we had. Uh, this, this is, if, if you look at this, this really is by any standard a model for cooperation. If this case went for years, it was complicated, we fought it through, and I, I like looking back at this and, and, and believing that we really made some inroads. I'm looking forward to tomorrow to, to deciding did it make a difference? I, I, I think uh, in many respects it might have. But let's, let's break through the trial. We, we worked together, successful model. The states did document review. We did witness prep. We did the whole thing. We were right there with Karma and, and Phil and others. So that, that was, that's not to be lost. Our experts, as Steve said, played a role uh, in fashioning uh, the, uh, the resolution to this. When we went on the appeal, uh, we went through the mediation, you recall, and that uh, Judge Posner is a very, very fine judge, a highly respected judge. His great strength, I must say, was not mediation. And the states were effectively left out of that process, uh, which I think was uh, unfortunate for, for the process itself. Uh, when we did get a mediator after that, uh, after uh, Judge Posner, I think it was critical of the states. Uh, for disrupting this thing, we, uh, we, we went on ahead and we did reach a, a, a settlement uh, with a, 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 a more professional mediator and we appreciated Judge Posner's effort, but it just did not yield. On the appeal, and this is a personal standpoint, but I, I, I was sitting there and I was on pins and needles as we watched that appeal occur. And we had some great people from the Solicitor General's office, we had enormous talent. The states brought a guy in. We looked all over the place, and we got a guy named John Roberts. We thought John Who? was the right guy. He's, he's gone on. You, you probably heard of him since. I, and I defy. You know, I think John's argument to the court may have been one of those consolidating moments that retained the integrity and, the, and kept that that uh, decision largely intact. Now I defy any of you to say it's not true. Uh, <laughs> But, but John was an important part of that, and the way he reached out to the court was critical. In combination, it made a huge difference. Uh, the remedy Steve has talked about, we've stayed in the game. And, and this is a point that I really am I'm curious about. I, it, Brad and I talk, and, and, and many of us continue to talk, trying to find the right, the right answer uh, with the state still in this and with, with the judge's most recent ruling. But there's something about having the cop on the beat. When we got the remedies decision from Judge Kohler Catelli, I think we, we were clearly disappointed. We thought we might get more, we fought for more. But because we got 
that ability to control a little bit. We had engagement, we had much closer contact with Microsoft and with, with DOJ. We did the, the joint status reports. Uh, all of that was an important way of saying there's still cops on the beat. And so just in summary, if we, if we lose that, there's an effort to preempt, you know, simplify the world and run everything from Washington. But I think the flexibility, the credibility that was part of this case really makes a, a very strong argument for this kind of an effort in this kind of a, a, a situation. So that's, that's my quick overview. Thanks, Tim. Um, I think tomorrow a lot of the speakers are going to deal with some of the specific conduct, uh, tying and so forth. Uh, and I'm sure that they are going to address the department's uh, new reports in part. So I'm going to, in the interest of time, dispense with applying uh, how some of the department's latest pronouncements would have affected the Microsoft case in the interest of taking questions from the audience and, and getting uh, some discussion going. So, sir. I, uh, I, I agree that it's human nature to write this stuff down. It is not human nature to get it into the record of an antitrust <laughs> case. If I were writing an historical novel about the Microsoft case, I would have a conversation something like this. Papa Gates, Bill, you've got to get an antitrust compliance program. He explains what it is. Bill, Dad, I don't want to subject my staff to all that crap. <laughs> so Microsoft didn't have an antitrust compliance program of any uh, weight. And as a result, you've got all these emails coming into the record. Now, let's take the other big gorilla on the information technology street, Intel. I spent the better part of a month reading Intel's email and its decision-making documents uh, for the FTC's case against Intel in the late 1990s. I can tell you those, that documentation was squeaky clean. <laughs> Nothing got through the screen. Uh, not only were people very careful, well, who knows what they wrote, but, never, but got destroyed immediately. Uh, but there just wasn't anything incriminating. And not only that, but in the key uh, strategic decisions, the corporate counsel was always there, and the documentation on those decisions was protected by attorney-client privilege. My guess is that AMD is going to have one hell of a time proving its case against Intel. You, you're absolutely right that the case certainly raised awareness and people are much, much more careful about what they write. I still submit that there's always a nugget to be found. There's, there's, a war, there's a war story on that FTC case, if I could follow it up. In Intel headquarters, there are, you know, these, uh, all these physical exercise machines, these torture machines, you know, you run on to be healthy, and there are TV screens overhead. And it's like in every gym in America, in most TV screens, that you, you're watching CNN or something, but I had an eyewitness account who shall not be disclosed, tell me that at Intel headquarters, up on the screen in the, in the, in the physical fitness thing was the Bill Gates deposition that they were all, <laughs> that they were all forced to watch. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> I'm I'm that. When there were legal pads, one of my clients said, don't say it, write it. I don't know those. Uh, one, 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 I think one, favorable thing for us in obtaining evidence in the Microsoft case is not many emails came from Bill Gates's box, but we got his emails because his subordinates had held on to them because they're the director's directions from the CEO of the company and they wanted to make sure that they had them and they wanted to make sure they had a record of the long emails that they spent till three o'clock in the morning uh, on Sunday before sending off to them. So. But I think, I think it's, I, I would raise the question as to whether it's, the evidence was so good there, whether it has raised expectations in other antitrust cases that there will be that kind of evidence when uh, I, think, I think people are being, are being more careful. Any, yes, Karen. 
in the absence of a Microsoft person on the panel, this is sort of a devil's advocate question because the, tr the trial of You obviously got a spectacular ruling from Judge Jackson, but if you look at the original Court of Appeals decision, and we all talked about this case uh, as a tying case, and as I recall, and I didn't read this before I came here, but I read it at the time, in 2001, um, the appeals court judges said that you sort of had gotten it all wrong on time. I mean, it was, in fact, you know, an affirmed in part and reversed in part situation. And I just wanted to see if you are, learned any lessons from that. Are you, are you referring to? Fisher has, a very, has something to say about that. I do. Uh, OK. My perception is that case was not about tying. And the tying claim was simply misplaced. Uh, you're, you're talking about the consent decree case, Karen. No, no. No, we're talking about the, we're talking about the big case, Microsoft 3. OK. I, I agree with Professor Fisher on, on that. Time was uh, one avenue, and it, it, it was a monopolization. The conduct that uh, would have constituted time is also found to be an anti-competitive act under Section 2. Right. Maintenance is Exactly. I think there's been well, some. I'm, I'm right. Decisioning. All, I'm, not, I'm trying to see if you learned any lessons about how to conduct a trial from what the, the appeals court said. Well, I would go back and say, make the point I made before, which I think the, the reason that Judge Jackson uh, just entered the remedy that he, uh, uh, the government wanted was he was concerned about the unsettled law of time. If you look at what the Court of Appeals did, uh, I think he was absolutely correct because it was totally unforeseeable. There was a case called Jefferson Parish, uh, which says uh, you know, the time is uh, per se with a market screen. The Court of Appeals did something completely unpredictable, created a separate rule of reason test uh, for time, which they limited only to platform software, right? I, you know, I don't think anybody could have foreseen that. And that's one reason I suggested it would be a good thing in the future, especially with laws unsettled, if you could get a ruling from the appellate court, uh, language of the law, would take a long time. Yeah, our, our, I think my, my view is that the, the Court of Appeals decision, while it, it took issue with a few things that, that Judge Jackson did, including uh, throwing out the attempted uh, monopolization of the, of the browser market point was uh, was a, uh, a a solid affirmance of the basic theory of the case that they had monopolized the operating system market, which was the fundamental core of the case. And and unfortunately, I think there are those uh, Microsoft, quite understandably, that seized on the. Uh, aspects of, of the case that the Court of Appeals did not find convincing uh, to justify that, uh, to, you know, to take what they could out of the decision. Unfortunately, I'm afraid, uh, to speak quite frankly, I'm afraid that when the Department of Justice started receiving uh, criticisms about the remedy, that there were certain high-level people at the division who mischaracterized the decision uh, post hoc uh, as, 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 as a justification, and it's, it would, in my view, uh, intellectually dishonest and not appropriate for a law enforcement official. But that's just my point of view. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm, I'm pleased to hear that there was a lot of attention paid to the remedy going in. But one of the things that I've explored as a contrafactual is the use of IP misuse remedies uh, in cases like this. Because going in, anybody on the prosecution side had to believe that a, uh, that a simple fine wouldn't affect the sorts of changes you were looking at. And you had to know that any type of structural remedy would raise complicated uh, implementation and enforcement issues. And one of the things that I've looked at and really have explored in several places is what would have happened had you gone in seeking a remedy along uh, IP misuse? Because Windows was, of course, this complex bundle of copyrights and patents and trade secrets and various other things, and simply ask the court to refuse to enforce any of the IP rights in Windows until Microsoft had corrected the damage that it had done to the market, which effectively would have meant forever for the lifetime of the software. 
Uh, I, off the top of my head, that remedy would present a number of problems. Uh, first, it would be a massive taking uh, and, and perhaps disproportionate to the, to the offense. Uh, second, um, if, unless, you, unless it was a license for all time, I think it would be very difficult for any business to take that intellectual property and, um, and, and run with it. Um, it, 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 it's one that that uh, wouldn't necessarily create more. I mean, Windows is an is an evolving platform. Um, the, I, I, you could probably buy a Windows 95 pretty cheap right now uh, to to just license Windows or make them give up the license to Windows as it as it stood now uh, or at that time really wouldn't be an effective remedy. It wouldn't take into account the dynamic nature of the market. That, again, that's my personal opinion. I think John is clearly correct. If you look at Judge Collard Catelli's opinion, uh, she rejected a number of the remedies put forward by the states precisely on the grounds uh, that John just articulated. Well, th there is actually a 1973 Supreme Court case against Glaxo that, uh, as I shepherdized, that had rarely been cited, that says explicitly that the courts can refuse to uh, enforce IP rights as a remedy in an antitrust case if you can show that it's proportionate, which of course would have been, I, I would hardly think that Microsoft would have rolled over had anybody proposed that that remedy and simply said, oh gee, I guess we lost. So I think it is safe to say that it would have been contested. Yeah. Yes, Doug. I mean, you've got to ask yourself, what wrong are you in remedy? To say that Microsoft couldn't enforce it intellectual property in its operating system, by the way, I think it not, would not be supportive of it. It's useful. But even if it were, it wouldn't be an appropriate remedy for an antitrust violation that didn't allege or prove that Microsoft's monopoly was illegal. The allegation and the proof was that Microsoft raised pension barriers. Well, they didn't say that you ought to look for a remedy if you're going to try to undo that situation of low pension barriers, not the one that destroys the legal monopoly. So it wouldn't have been a remedy because it's conceptually ill-suited for the wrong point. Yes, sir. I, I disagree on two points. First of all, there's a huge body of antitrust law involving compulsory licensing uh, as the solution of high-tech case problems. More than 100 cases, probably. Uh, as of 1958, there were more than 100 cases. Uh, but second, one could have implemented selected, more narrow, not blunderbuss intellectual property uh, remedies. So my colleagues Robert Lightan, Bill Nordhaus, and uh, Roger Knoll laid out a set of possible re intellectual property remedies that I suspect would have been quite effective. Uh, that suggestion was not taken up. But again, yeah, effective. To do what? To do, do what? what? Or, 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 or to restructure the industry? Mandatory disclosure of source code. And, and, and what violate, what wrong caused by the violation would that have cured? And, and, and what, what, when AT&T was required to license its 9,000 patents uh, in the 1956 consent uh, settlement, uh, how had it violated anything with respect to patents? But that was an effective remedy to, well, it wasn't very effective. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was a relevant remedy. Actually, the IBM case, which was uh, handed down, a decree handed down the same, uh, uh, the same month, uh, was quite effective in opening up parts of the computer industry. And if you look at the Xerox, settlement in 1975 and read Peter McCulloch's retrospective on it, you will see that, I, uh, that the uh, compulsory licensing of intellectual property had major impacts of a pro-consumer sort, opening up the copying machine industry to new competition, forcing Xerox to get off its haunches, design more reliable machines, and get them out there at lower price costs. Well, I, I think I think that the 
again, uh, here I'll be speaking on behalf of the, the department after I left, so in that sense, we'll be, <laughs> we'll be speaking as, as the devil's advocate. advocate. Uh, what, what Microsoft did in, 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 in increasing the barriers to entry uh, uh, by eliminating the browser as a platform threat was to eliminate the browser as a, as a platform threat. You could not made it more difficult for uh, firms to 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 uh, use other use interfaces other than the Windows interface uh, to um, to write applications or to interface with 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 the web, uh, and I believe that the licensing the mandatory licensing provisions that are in the consent decree were designed to address that situation. But uh, again, I'm, I'm Phil may want to expand on that, but but that that's that is how they attempted to ta tailor the remedy, which to me uh, uh, seems, seems uh, a lot more tailored to the offense than you know, blanket licensing of, of the whole operating system. Uh -huh. So all good topics to continue, although maybe more fun to do it over drinks and a little bit of food. Let me just say part of what makes the remedy question so tricky here is exactly that, that the conduct was alleged to have excluded a nascent technology, which might and we can't know because it was killed, but might have ultimately created a threat that would undermine the monopoly itself. And as the DC Circuit recognized, you can't just let that go because it happened so early, but it makes it really hard to tailor the remedy to put things back how they might have been without doing more. Thank you, Bill.